Right, are we on, Shane? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode five of the Glorious Years series. As part of the club's 150th anniversary, we are taking a trip down memory lane on a glorious period uh, in the club's history, the six Lords uh, Trophy one-day final victories from 1999 to 2004. Uh, for this episode five, we are talking about the 2003 C&G Trophy final. It was a massive, uh, comfortable victory over Worcestershire uh, by seven wickets um, and would be um, a return to a trophy win after a two-year hiatus, including actually one Lord's final defeat against Surrey. Um, and we are very pleased and thankful for three more uh, guests uh, who all played a major part in that day and of course many others besides them. Um, I will start with our first guest uh, who played for the club between 2001 and 2014. Uh, his Gloucestershire career included 28 hundreds and 78 half centuries and he also took 150 wickets in his time. In List A cricket he played 172 matches for Gloucestershire and scored 3,964 runs. That makes him 13th in the club's history books. Um, in the match concern in 2003, he took two for 12 off his seven overs and scored 12 not out to be there at the end to see the club home to a comfortable victory. He's now first team coach at Worcestershire. Um, and we'd like to say a big uh, welcome to Alex Gibman. Alex, how, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's, um, it's going to be nice to chat about it, actually. It's cool. Uh, a bit, bit, bit of a strange time, obviously. You, sh you should have been coaching your, your team, obviously, in the middle at the moment. But how, how have you been going during this period? Um, I, look, it's like everyone. Um, it's been a quite a, a different time, obviously. Some, some anxiety, some concerns. Um, but just, you know, just generally just trying to take each day at a time um, and kind of looking forward to the light at the end of the tunnel when, when and if that comes. So, um, you know, like all players, coaches, supporters, you know, all desperately keen to, to watch some cricket, play some cricket. Um, you know, and we're hopeful that day will be, be with us sooner rather than later. But um, it's certainly been a challenge. Um, but uh, like I say, looking forward to hopefully the end sooner rather than later. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Alex, for joining us. Uh, our second guest I'd like to introduce now is a right, was a right arm fast medium bowler um, and known for his swing bowling and, and his uh, close control. Played for Gloucestershire between 1995 and 2011, uh, including 194 list day matches and 258 list day wickets. That puts him fifth on the uh, Gloucestershire history uh, books, um, just, just behind Mike Proctor, so he's in good company there. Um, he is the last Gloucestershire cricketer to represent England, uh, but he'd actually be the first Gloucestershire player to play an in, uh, international T20 for England. Um, played, of course, in Test and ODI cricket as well. In this match, he took two for 28 off his 10 overs. Um, he played in, uh, of course, all the Lords finals uh, from that period. Uh, now a coach for the ECB. Uh, big welcome to John Lewis. Thanks for joining us, John. Pleasure, Percy. Pleasure, mate. Nice, nice to be here. And like, like Alex said, really um, interested and excited to see if we can remember what happened on that day. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, look, well, we'll get into that. But what have you been doing, you know, in recent months and, and, and what are your movements at the moment? Um, so I suppose I had um, a really nice time, actually, when I, I was furloughed. It was, uh, it was really, really nice. I spent some time at home with the family. We spent a lot of time on tour uh, with ECB in the winter. and I've been away quite a lot on my job. I know I get out on the road quite a lot and I don't spend a hell of a lot of time at time home. So it's been nice to spend some a period of time at home. And then for the last month or so, I've been um, out on the road again, trying to help the coaches, the bowling coaches around the country, um, get all the, the England fast bowlers back up and ready to go for the, the test matches starting on the 8th of July. And then the, the one day series starting at the end of, um, end of July against Ireland. So I've been pretty busy actually the last, last month, but prior to that, for six or eight weeks, I was enjoying some time at home with the family. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, uh, I'll come on to our third guest, um, who played for the club between 1999 and 2006, uh, was undoubtedly one of the greatest overseas players in the club's history. 
Uh, he played 101 list A matches for the club, scored 2,879 runs. That places him 18th on our list. Uh, he took 211 list A wickets. That's, that makes him 11th on our uh, historic list. Played 73 one-day internationals for Australia. For regular listeners to this series will know he was nicknamed Freak. Um, he, in this match, he was player of, of the match, uh, hitting uh, quick fire 60 and taking two wickets as well. Um, and he, he completes the triumvirate of coaches. So he is actually now a colleague of mine, been on the Gloucestershire coaching staff since 2015, which included another one day final victory for the club that year. Um, big welcome to Ian Harvey. Thank you for joining us, Harves. Oh, thanks for having me, mate. Uh, the same as uh, Louis and Ghetto. It's nice to, as John put it, see if we can remember what happened all those years ago. But it was obviously a, a great time for us and um, a great time personally on the day for myself to get man of the match and obviously just contribute for, for a win for, well, another win for the boys. Yeah, I, I do want to start with you, Harves, because... We've we've now we've had four uh, episodes in this series, and your name crops up very heavily in in all of them. Um, and, and I think it starts with your signing, which seems to have been um, a catalyst for change for the club. Um, John Bracewell made the point to us in the last time that he kind of wanted a change of the culture from maybe a massive reliance on Courtney Walsh, um, and recruited you with a view to all round, you know, strength in county championship and of course, one day cricket. Um, I just want to know from your side, what was, you know, you ever heard of Gloucestershire and, and, and how did it come about for you? Yeah, I'd obviously heard a lot about Gloucestershire because I think back in, I think it was 92, 93, Louis had probably know more than me on that one. John Lewis, uh, John, John Lewis, um, Andrew Simons signed for the club. And I remember I was at the academy with Simo and I'll, I remember the day that he, he told me that he was going to sign for Gloucestershire. And obviously he went on to, to do many good things for the club as well. But uh, look, from my point of view, uh, I think JB had asked around and I think I got recommended by Alan Border, which was a great honour for me as well. But also when I got the phone call, um, from JB about would I be interested in signing and um, to fill those boots of Courtney Walsh is just well it can never be done at all and I'll never forget when I, I did sign and it came out that the very first person who called me um, he had to actually call me three times because I hung up on him twice because I didn't believe it was him was Courtney Walsh <laughs> so, Courtney actually rang me and wished me all the best and um, what a great club it was to play for. And I'd obviously heard good things from Andrew Simons as well. And uh, from my point of view, it didn't take me two seconds, but to say yes and then put pen to paper. And I suppose the rest is history. And I had a great time at the club and um, being back there now as a coach is um, probably something back then that I would only have dreamt of. John, I just want to ask you from your side. So, you know, you, you, you predated Harv at Gloucestershire, and then you saw him come come to the club. And, of course, you bowled in tandem a lot with him. Um, you know, how would you sum up that sort of change in culture that John Bracewell brought and, and the signing of, of Harv's? Uh, brave. Really brave, I would say. You know what I mean? Like, from the head coach's point of view, like, we're all coaches now, and you, you look at what, what he did then and the way he changed the culture of the team and the way we, he talked to us as a... A group of players he just said to us look you can't sit around hanging on Courtney Walsh's coattails forever you guys have got to actually earn your own money and do your own job and and he took a he took his first year as coach to have a look at that and then he he made that decision and within the ranks there was a little bit of like oh crikey um and at the same time he I think he released four other guys as well and signed Jeremy Snape and Kim Barnett so he brought three guys in there that were exper very very experienced one-day cricketers um and exceptional one day cricketers actually you know, guys with really good records and reliable reliable cricketers and but yeah i think it was a really brave move really courageous for a coach to do that um and you know it's obviously paid off so people people call him a visionary but it could have easily have gone the other way as well so and he would have been out the door so you know very brave from him i wanted to sort of now move on to i guess the the, the run-up to the final and, and and the path to it um 
Alex, this, you know, from your side of things, Gloucestershire's story, they, they'd gone 22 years without a trophy. They, they then won in 1999 and then became the dominant one-day team. You had, uh, in, by 2003, you had two years without a trophy. Um, and, and this is your first sort of, it would be your first final. What was it like stepping into that team um, with all that experience around you? Um, it was, it, to be totally honest, it was very easy because they're all, you know, massively experienced players, international players. Um, you know, they played a huge amount of cricket together by that stage. Um, you know, it was, so for a young guy to come in, it was actually, like I say, really, really easy. I think you know, these days there's very few teams that have, you know, a lot of older players with, with one or two younger ones. It's generally the other way around. I think I was probably the only under, I don't know, 26, 27-year-old in that group. And um, without knowing it, I had absolutely no pressure on me whatsoever. You know, I felt I put pressure on myself, but these guys were just so good. It actually didn't really matter what I was doing. I just They just let me play um, and because they were just... Um, so skillful themselves, you know, winning games single-handedly. So it was a very easy team for a young guy to come into. Um, there was very low expectation on my shoulders. I just just made a lot of mistakes and learned from them, but managed to contribute enough throughout, you know, throughout to keep my space in the team. So um, you know, extremely lucky, um, but ultimately, you know, very easy. I think. Well, looking at that run up to the final, um, I mean, round three is a humongous win against Buckinghamshire. Um, Kent in round four was a five-wicket victory. Uh, Warwickshire in the quarter-final, another five-wicket victory. They were all away. Um, Derbyshire at home in the semi-final was a one-wicket win, um, chasing 219. Uh, I, I suppose I've got a couple of questions here. Start with you, Alex. You featured more prominently in the run-up than the other two guys. I think a bit of uh, international call-up and um, injury and rotation. Um, what what was your memories of that run up and and also you know the semi final was very much the Gidman and Show of Malik show you scored forty one and took a wicket. What's, what's I remember the semi final really well. Um, the quarter final, I think, did you say that was against Warwickshire? Yeah, yeah, I remember the quarter final. There's something happened. That Harv did something in that game. I think he was available for that game. He, he ran someone out fielding at like a like a silly kind of mid off short mid off thing and if i remember correctly it was whacked to him the non striker was out of his out of his ground and half threw the stumps down left handed so he picked it up with two hands and just threw it over his right shoulder with his left hand and it was a key wicket i can't remember exactly who it was but that i remember that really really clearly i'm pretty sure it was that quarter final um the semi final half yeah you're right half wasn't available um cuz we had show of malik um but it, uh, look, it was a it was a really really good game of cricket actually. Um, I think Derby got two twenty odd or something. So we back in the day on our sort of wickets, that wasn't a bad score. It wasn't a good score, but it wasn't a bad score. It was never going to be easy. I think um, you know a few of us probably felt the pressure a little bit of of a, of a semi final, which is which is quite natural, I suppose. Um, what do I remember specifically? I remember Spears in the chase got us off to a good start as he as he usually did. Um, but then Kevin Dean, that left arm seamer, literally about sixty miles an hour, but bold, huge, huge in swingers, um, and he got a couple of wickets like really close together. I remember batting three because Hard wasn't there, and I think he got Spears. So I went out, and then he got John T. Um, literally first or second ball and then Matt Windows, I think in the same over. So we sort of went from, I don't know, something like 40, 50 for one to literally sort of 55, 60 for three or four really quickly. And from that moment on, it obviously became quite a close chase, quite a close game. Myself and Show put on, I think, quite a big partnership. And then, you know, as I was quite good at doing at that age, give game a wicket away when I was on about 35, 40 and sort of, the rest was a bit of a scramble, but I think Shoaib ended up being sort of 70, 80 odd, I think not out actually. Um, but as we were chatting just before, um, James Ayres, I think, managed to score the winning runs with a flick off the legs down to a fine leg, I think. And, um, you know, for my first semi final victory and going to Lords, I went absolutely, you know, eight. The, the rest of the lads were sort of, oh, yeah, been there, done it, yeah, off we go again. But I was, you know, very, very excited. And uh, I think someone might have. Um, might have uh, given me my first cigar to celebrate. I was like, oh, yeah, we'll get used to this. It was quite cool. Um, 
so yeah, some, some, I don't remember the fielding and the bowling that much, but I think particularly that chase, I just remember being very nervous whilst before batting and batting and then watching, I was not in a good place, I don't think. But, uh, you know, obviously, thankfully, it all worked out in the end. It was good. Oh, do you remember that left-handed run out? Because this has come up in a couple of the chats. I think it was Ian Bell. Uh, yeah, I do remember. I think it was. I think Knighty was batting and he, I was fielding at like a short mid wicket, I think. And uh, he just chipped one off his, off his pads. And it was just instinct. I just picked it up, hoping someone was backing up. I didn't even think I'd come close to hitting the stumps, but it just came out absolutely perfect. And I just remember the look on Bowley's face was like, I can't believe that's just happened. And then, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it does live in the memory. Probably, well, it was the only one I ever did left-handed, but um, probably one's better than none. Looking at the preparations for the final, um, so I'll front up. Every week I've asked a group of different players how they prepared for the Big Lords game. And every week I've had the same answer, that, 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 that there was no difference between preparing for a Lords final and preparing for any other match. John, is that the case with this match and this, this year? Yeah, I, I remember that you know, we used to get together the night before and um, have a big old Chinese down the, down the Queen's Way and smash in a few Tiger beers. That was the way we used to um, prepare for, uh, for a Lord's final. Um, so it was, um, that was no, no different. And the practice the day before, everyone was, I remember the, this team, um, not this team in particular, but the team across that period of time being extremely relaxed and looking forward to the finals. And that was my impression anyway. I don't know, that was just me. And it just seemed like fun rather than, um, than anything else. And we just went down there and enjoyed the, enjoyed the occasions. What about you, Alex, your, your first one? I mean, you said you're, you're obviously very excited to get there. Do you remember the preparations? Do you remember sort of heading to Lords the day before and what that, you know, what, soaking that up? Uh, Less so the day before. I, I agree with Louis. I think we had, had a, a couple of beers and some dinner somewhere. Um, but I think, as I said, that was why, well, certainly one of the reasons why we were so good was these, these experienced guys. They just carried on as normal. It, it did become another game and they coped with the pressure of it really, really well. I don't know if that was the same, you know, in the, in the very first one or the first couple, but by this stage, you know, it, they were very comfortable with the surroundings and stuff. So it, it was it was very relaxed, but also, you know, when you've got the likes of these guys in the team, there was also that steely kind of like, we know we're here, we're here for a good time, but we're also here definitely to win, you know, once it, you could just feel that sort of steeliness about the group. Um you know, and I, and I, I was obviously extremely nervous. I, I remember that. Um, but as I as I said, it it was made easier by um, by being around these guys who were you know who were very 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 good, which which made it very easy. Yeah. Well, on the day itself, I mean, it was a a, a win toss and bowl. Um, Mark Elaine's told us that you know he, he never really strategized too much about the, the toss, and he just had a feeling on this one that it, it was a bowl first. Harv, did, did you remember? That being the case, that it, it was always going to you wanted to bowl first because obviously you won many matches as a team batting first and squeezing the opposition. Yeah, I, th I think I mean a lot of people with early morning starts at Lords uh, around that time of the year would suggest that you you'd bowl first. And but I, I think at that stage we were so comfortable within our team. Uh, I mean, I suppose it was everyone did say that yeah, we we used to bat first, get as many as we can, and then we'd squeeze with the ball. But I think we we had no problems batting, uh, bowling first and and then chasing them down. I mean, we had to be. Everyone said we were only a side that could ever win at home. That soon got thrown out the window with all the trophies, and we still won a lot of games away from home. So I think one of the great things about our team was that we never re we didn't rely on one or two individuals. And that's one of the great things throughout all these games. Yes, there's some individual brilliance. You talk about Boo Boo's 100 and, and stuff like that, but 90% of all our wins came as a team and we didn't really rely on one or two individuals, but we relied on guys to do their job and do their role in the team. And 
nine times out of ten, the guys did that. And that didn't really matter whether we batted first, bowled first. We knew that if we put ourselves in a position to win a game, we knew that oppositions, they got very panicky against us. It'd be like, oh, here we go again. The Gloucesters, oh, here we go again. But we put ourselves in that position and we had that belief as a team that no matter what situation we were in, we were going to win. And that was a great feeling to have. Well, I mean, that's probably um, best shown here in this match. Worcester should go from 64 for nothing and, you know, fall apart. They, 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 go, they crumbled to 149 all late. Uh, the wickets are shared. But, um, you know, do you think that was a bit of it? But, but once you've taken the first one, the pressure sort of, of, of what you've done before in those finals crept, you know, crept into their minds half? I think so, definitely. But I mean, to be honest, I think I got a bit lucky with um, Graham Hick. I, I remember uh, bowling the juiciest half volley outside our stump. <laughs> Could have hit it anywhere on the ground as Hickey normally does. And he just chipped it straight to Steamy. And it was like, I think we all just looked at each other and just went, I can't believe that. And then the rest of it was we, we then, once we, and we did, as I said, we believed that if we get that breakthrough, even if you look at their batting lineup, you think we can still squeeze this and we can chase these runs down. And as we said, once we got that breakthrough, then we got a couple more and then it starts going through their team. And then we come into our own. We were very good at the death end. We had guys who were good at their roles in that team. And that's why um, I think we were so successful. But on that day, we believe we get a wicket, we'll keep squeezing and the rest will come. And, and, and it did. Well, I think we got a picture of John taking a wicket on that day, actually. Um, John, do, do you remember bowling in that game any more than the rest, or is it, you know? Yeah, I do. I remember that. Yeah, I remember the game well, um, primarily because I watched the highlights this morning. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I had a little look back and see what see what we did because they do merge. They do merge together. But yeah, um, that game in particular, and I'm just coming in on the back of what Harv said there. I think the team was a, was had evolved actually over time, and we definitely started as a team that liked to defend totals. But as we got more confident and we won, and we won away from home, the team really evolved. And this team in particular, um, with Ian and um, Craig Spearman at the top of the order, um, had played in a very different way to the way we started playing, um, with real, real aggression um, in the power play. And I, and I just remember that there was 15 overs of power play. And in this final in particular, I saw that we were, we were nearly 100 off the 15 overs, chasing 140, because of the way Phil, um, Ian and Craig had attacked. Even though Craig only got 10 runs, he set the tone for us and he, he gave the other rest of the guys freedom to play around in the middle. Um, so, and I, the thing that I do remember about that, that, that final in particular was John T. Um, it was a big thing around him and his fielding and how, how, what he brought to the team. But what he did is he just added to the team, uh, added to the already good fielding side. And I think when Mike Smith came, went off, Chris Taylor came on the field as well as our 12th man. He was an outstanding fieldsman along with Matt Windows. And, and Mark Elaine took a brilliant take at the stumps um, on the half volley from John T. It was a terrible throw to get our first wicket. And once we, you could almost see, I was watching, like I said, watching the highlights, you could see the um, energy within the team and the, and the way that the team moved and we were a very hard team to play against because of our discipline with the ball no, no one was outstanding they had great discipline and good skill and then that team in particular had a very powerful batting lineup and um, all the way down really that was a, it was a really good side and it was also two wickets for you Alex but you, you, you did bowl for the club obviously but you weren't you know a regular sort of 10 over in, in one day cricket so you know what? What was the what was the reason for your seven overs and that day? Bit of luck. <laughs> no, I, I was I was a very nervous bowler. Actually, I I, I didn't ever really um, you know back myself as a bowler. Uh, I was very nervous most of the time about bowling. So when when Smudge went off, it was kind of like it was going to going to go one of two ways. I think it was either going to be two overs for twenty five, and you know we're scraping around the barrel for some more overs somewhere, or, or it went okay and. You know, thankfully for for me and the group, it it went okay, and I sort of burbled a couple of wickets. But I, I I sort of got into a rhythm, and when I got into a rhythm, I I was fine. But sometimes I just struggled to find that rhythm, and uh, 
you know, I, I think nerves played a huge part on that day. But, you know, we all need nerves and sometimes they can get the better of you. But thankfully, I think they probably helped me sort of turn that into excitement. And once I bowled one good over, I really, really wanted to bowl another good over. And just, as the other guys are saying, you get the momentum of the whole day and then you just want to play your part in that. You know, you want to do your job and you you watch the couple of run outs and as half said, he gets hick out and... You know, once you get hick out, you're like, oh, this, you know, we're on here, um, and a couple more, and what have you, and you know, you could just feel the whole kind of squeeze, and I guess subconsciously, it was just wanting to be part of that success and and, and play my part. You wanna, you wanna sit back at the end of the day and, um, of, you know, enjoy your beer as a winner, but also kind of feeling that you played a significant part in in the day. So, um, yeah, I had some bad days with the with the ball, but thankfully that was, um, you know, that was one of my better ones. Uh, it was really enjoyable. Well, at the interval, obviously, 149 uh, to beat. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you wouldn't have been complacent, but was there? A, 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 do you remember the feeling in, in the dressing room? Was it really confident, really comfortable? Um, I actually, I don't remember the, the interval that well in, in terms of how we were feeling as a group, but I, I do know that, um, you know, as Half said, we're very, very confident, just as, as a collective, really, about how we, you know, the fact we would we would win the game. I don't think there's ever any doubt that we'd win the game. Um, you know, I think like any chase in any scenario, you're always you're always wanting that nice start, whether that's a quick start or whatever, but just a solid start. And you know, as as Louis said, we lost Spears relatively early, but he'd already hit a couple over the top and he'd set the tone. And I think Wes had, had crashed a couple of four, so we were probably on I don't know twenty five thirty before uh, before Spears got out. Um, and you kind of feel then that the, the game's in our hands. Um, but then, you know, obviously to watch Half go out and do what he did was, you know, and the Lord's final, particularly for me as a young player, I was just like, wow, this is this is brilliant. And, and I was next in. I, I didn't really want to go in because I just wanted to keep watching and watching Half back with Wes. It was uh, it was great to watch. Um, you know, and you know when you're sandwiched between between Ian Harvey and, and John T. Rhodes as a number four in that team, you know, I, I sort of felt very at ease, really. And uh, it was nice to, to watch those guys do the bulk of the work. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to be there at the very end, but um, the work was, was tre- well and truly done though, there by, by Harv and, and Spears and Wes. It was, it was amazing to watch. And, you know, the game was over uh, in a flash, really, to be totally honest. But when we started, it was, it was gone. Um, and then we were we were celebrating, so it was it was it was good to watch and great to be a part of at the very end of that chase. Well, Harv, I, I do want to ask you about your innings because you know this is you know we must go back in time really. This is this is before T Twenty would you know taken over. Uh, you've smashed sixty one off what, thirty one balls or, or thirty odd balls, not many. Um, did did you like previous finals? Was there a club booking in the Hard Rock Cafe? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you tee off, or you just you just thought it was there and I'm going to hit? Um, yeah, I'd like to say I was thirsty, but look, to be honest, I in in all forms of the game, I I didn't have to change my game. I was always very aggressive, so I didn't really like I didn't have to change my game for the shorter version. It just gave me a little bit more of a license than obviously you do in four day cricket. But um, for me, look, on that day, as the boys have said. Spears like 10 off six and Wezzo 46 off 50. It was like they, they, we got off to a good start. And then it just allows you to come in. And, and also what helps is you've just bowled the opposition out for 140 odd. They know they've got to take wickets. They can't contain us. So they're going to try things and they're going to give you opportunities to score. And I just wanted to make sure that every opportunity they gave me, I was going to score off. And as I said, it just gave you a little bit more freedom, knowing that you've only got that and you've got the start that we had. And, and then you just have those days sometimes that uh, everything sort of goes your way. So luckily for me, it was in, in the final, uh, as I said earlier, about just just being able to contribute was, was great. I, I, I'd like to go back to Alex, actually, to ask him, you know, you're there at the end. So you, you get a winning moment. You're there with John T. Rhodes, um, you know, Describe that to us. Yeah, it's got to be one of the, one of the pinnacles for you, is it? Oh, hundred percent. I think back in the, those days, I mean, the Lords final was a huge, huge thing for for any cricketer. You know, it was massive, in particular, particularly for us as a club, continuing the run we we've been on, but also as a as a younger player at the start of my career, that was 
you know, genu genuinely, it sounds a bit cheesy, as genuinely as a county cricketer, what dreams are made of, you know, hitting the, or being in a position to win the Lords final and even hit the winning runs is just, um, you know, it was just, just brilliant. I, I was actually my most nervous then in the whole blooming game. So I didn't know what to do. I, I know that Hard would have just donked one straight over the top and would have walked off, you know, you know, the other guys would have just been a bit more patient. And I was actually my most nervous because I didn't want to get out and then someone else has to come out and get one run. You know, you look like a fool if you come down and try and whack it and you get stumped or something. So I, I, I was a bit, um, yeah, I was, I was sort of more more confused really about what to do then than any other part of the whole day. And John T at the other end kept coming down because I patted them back off, uh, off Batty. I just kept blocking it and they brought the field in obviously. And I was like, oh no, what do I do? And then to win it with an awful leading edge over, over extra cover as I try and whip another one through leg side was, you know, wasn't the greatest way to end the Lords final. But, um, you know, thankfully, um, well, I, I, I guess I don't really remember that now. It's more about the success and, and you know, winning, hitting the winning runs. I, I'll take that however we managed to, or however I managed to do it. I'll still, I'll still take that. But I think that the fondest moment for me was you know, when we were running through for the single and he I'd glanced up to the balcony because I'd, I'd hit it from the nursery end and I'd, I remember looking up to the to the balcony and all the lads were just there, you know, out of their seats, arms in the air, hugging each other. And, you know, although they'd been there so many times, they're still celebrating and meaning as much as it did. And that was extremely, extremely special. And whether it's a, a World Cup final or a, a domestic final, to look up to that famous Lord's balcony and to see your teammates you know, um, out of the seats is a very, very special memory and something that um, personally, I, you know, I'll never, ever forget. Do you, do you remember what you did afterwards? Because Mark, Mark Elaine told us that the only final he, he made a reservation for afterwards was the one where you didn't play on the whole of the, the Saturday and it went to a reserve day. Um, so that was a bit we still, of a... We still made the reservation though. <laughs> oh, we still went to the party on the, on the Saturday night and just went and played on the Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> he, did, he did allude to that, but he was on that chat, so he didn't probably give us as, as much info as he would have done maybe in his company. Um, I want to ask you all um, where it ranks in your Gloucestershire finals victories. They, um, uh, do you have a favourite final? Uh, let's start with you, Harps. You, you, you know, you, you, you perform very well in most, well, all of the finals, really. Do you have a favourite? It's, it's a tough one because they all have, in their own way, something very special about them. But I think it's hard to beat the first one when the club have worked so hard. And as, as Louis said uh, earlier, JB made a brave call. With, with getting me over. No one really knew who I was, but he made that call. And I, so I always, I just think that first one, because you never know if you're ever going to get back there. That's one thing that we always spoke about. This could be the last time you ever, ever come back. Or you're only ever time that some may ever play on Lords. So I think the first one is always going to be special. But as I said, all of them in their own way are special in, in different ways. Same to you, Louis. Um, do you have a favourite? Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with Harv, actually. Like, you, the first one was, was amazing. Like, you, you just don't know. Like, some players play their whole careers and don't win a trophy. You know what I mean? So they might play for 15 to 20 years and they're out their county and they don't win a trophy. And, like, you don't realise that, and it's even less trophies now you can win now, it's only three per season. It's only four trophies back there, and there was, you know, you only had four opportunities to win trophies. To win, the, win a trophy was, was an unbelievable feeling. And then from what happened after that was, you know, remarkable, really, in terms of the, the performances we kept putting in. And, the, and the, the team evolved and changed. And so the first one was really, really special against Yorkshire. We, we played some, we played fantastic cricket that day. You know, really, really cricket and really good cricket. And then, for me personally, I suppose the only the other one that stood out in my memory was the last one. You know what I mean? So, which I bob really well in as a uh, myself. And that was from a personal point of view, like oh god, that was probably the best I bowled. And that's what started my England career, I suppose, and kicked me on onto the next level because people show showed people what I could do on occasion, I suppose. So those two 
probably had the biggest influence on me, but the first one was really, really special. I, I did want to ask you about, about England recognition, actually, Louis, because, uh, and, and you, you've alluded to it there. Do you think that repeatedly playing in these big matches and performing well, was that what finally got you over the line? Because you've been knocking on the door for a long time. Yeah, I think so. I think when people see you perform well under pressure and performing at the highest level, as hard will, will tell you, is more about the, the scrutiny and the, and the pressure that's on you. And, and obviously the quality of the players are, that, that the quality is there, but the game is the same. So you actually, if you can deal with the pressure and understand what the, and, and the scrutiny that's on you and people picking apart your game, then, you know, that, that stands you in good stead. And playing in, you know, I didn't play in all the finals. I think I played in four out of seven, I think. And, um, and I, you know, I, I really enjoyed them. And, and similarly, when I played for England, I, I was never, I never got, only one time I got nervous was um, when I played at Bristol, actually, in the, uh, 2005 in a one-day game there in front of a full house at Bristol. And it was almost like, there was the expectation of me to do really well playing for England because it was my home ground, even though it was only my second game or third game for England. You know, I almost put too much pressure on myself that day. And that was the only time I really felt nervous um, in my whole career, really. Um, and I don't know if that's just me, but that's just the way I just always viewed it as a really exciting challenge and an opportunity and go out and have some fun. And that's the way I like to play and, and go for it uh, rather than and not worry about it if I get it wrong. So those that's my memories of that. And I suppose the the England stuff was, was similar. It's like no one really expected me to do that well. I didn't really expect me, me to do that well myself. So I just thought, I'll go and have fun and like half said, treat it as, as if it's your last game because it may well be. I, I, I wanted to ask you all the same question. Um, you've all moved into coaching. I'd like to start with asking you all what you have taken from John Bracewell, perhaps, um, if anything, you know, from, for your own coaching career. Louis, let's stay with you. you know, yeah. how, how has he been an influence on, on how you go about your coaching? A uh, massive, massive influence. Like someone who has that much influence on us as a, as a, as a team. And, and for me to be a, a big part of that team for so long, and for it to, his messages, they have to drip in you know, over time. And he taught us about collective and he taught us about team. Um, and that's why I think one of his greatest legacies. If you look at the player, the people who have gone into coaching and how many people that have played underneath him have gone into coaching, it will be because of that belief around collective and team and wanting to help your mates and understanding how to help your mate out when they're having a good day and when they're having a bad day as well. And that's one thing that he taught us um, alongside the fact that he would challenge us to improve all the time. You know, and, and, and I think we'll all agree that we didn't always see eye to eye with John as players. Um, and there's times where actually you thought, uh, and you didn't want to receive the ear bashing you might have got from him, but what he was trying to do was challenge you to improve. You know, so those are the two things that I've really taken from John around the collective and the team being more important than individuals. Um, and then the, uh, the stuff around improving players and making sure and challenging guys to improve, which players, players sometimes don't like. They like to be comfortable. And making players sometimes you've got to make players uncomfortable to get them better. Alex, same to you. Any sort of influences from from John to your coaching career? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm still learning a huge amount all the time as a, as a coach. Um, but I think it's probably in like in hindsight now how how influential John has been on sort of my coaching and, and as I sort of grow into coaching. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's just that. I guess it's the constant messages that he used to relay, particularly on the pitch stuff. I find it really easy to relate to one day cricket now and, and white ball cricket, T20 cricket. Um, you know, it hasn't changed a huge amount. Some of those basic things that the, that, that team, the Gloucester team did, um, you know, I still, I can see now the impact that they would have on, on modern day cricket. So specifically on the pitch stuff, I think with, with John now, um, you know, I still speak to John quite often, uh, messaging and stuff. I'd probably call him a, you know, the good old mentor word that's that's flown around these days. He's, he's someone I still chat to and ask questions, um, you know, to a, about how to handle different situations and stuff. So it's still a relationship that's, that's still very strong. And um, you know, again, in hindsight now, you probably realise how good he was. I think 
at times you probably think he's he's barking mad and you know why has he done that and you get frustrated with him or, or whatever but I guess now you, you, I realise how you know how good he was I think and you know very very fortunate to you know to have played under him actually and um, you know was, was very very thankful really because he started my playing career off really 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 well he gave me an opportunity to play with these sorts of players um, so yeah I, I have a lot to thank John for actually throughout. And, and half, what, what, what about you? What about you, mate? I, I think for me, I think Louis summed it up, especially from, I mean, the way he got those players to perform as a team and very quickly as well. I, I don't think it took very long. I think that's one of the big things for me um, with that group of players, uh, how he got them, um, what he focused on and... I think we were the best fielding team in the country. We fielded really, really well as a group. And we challenged each other. And that's one of the things he, he got out of us, that he wanted us to challenge each other. Out in the middle, off the ground. He wanted to make us um, a team, that, as, as we mentioned earlier, that whatever the situation we're put in, we could believe that we could win that. And I mean, everyone keeps talking about the, the glory days of the one-day cricket white ball stuff but it was still quite tough to beat in four day cricket as well so I think that obviously the one day side of it is um, what everyone speaks about but I, I also think that we did come forward in four day cricket as well and I think he had a, a massive part to play in that I, I, Can I go off the back of that stuff first? Is that alright? Um, I just wanted to like say as well like John, John was um, people say ahead of his time but this the way that we played cricket at that time changed the way that people play cricket to, to how they play now. So the, the way that we we bowled and fielded and had jack up to the stumps all the time made other teams evolve. The teams evolved and played better one day cricket because of it. You know, if you think about how now guys sweep, so that our team might might still have done some basic things really well, but we had short guys on slow wickets, and guys would sweep us now. You know, so the game would change and we would have had to adapt it and change with it. But the, what we did was it helped the game one day cricket evolve, probably internationally around the world. So you know, there, was a, there was a really, really amazing evolution of one day cricket. And it started, I think, when John came over to, to, um, to Gloucestershire and, and taught us how to do that. You know, and I think that was a, a great legacy for him. Well, now you're coaching, Louis, you go, you go and see a lot of the best that the country's got to offer in terms of young young bowlers. How would you coach a young John Lewis? <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Tell him to get out of the yeah, good luck, mate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, well, that's a really, really tricky question to talk about yourself like that. Um, yeah, um, so I had, a, I had a quite a pivotal moment in my career was around um, uh, when I got injured. Um, I got, had a really bad back, back injury around, I think it was around 2002, something like that. Um, and um, maybe 2001, 2002, somewhere like that. And I then became much more professional about how, how I went about my business. Um, so if I was going to try and help myself at a younger age, I'd have encouraged, my, encouraged me to to be more professional and train harder and value my, value my practice more um, and maybe become more consistent with my, my mentality and my routine. Because um, that's the things that I changed more as I, as I came back from, from that injury. So I got a lot fitter. Um, my mental routines were much better. I was much more consistent. And I understood my game more. Um, really for the first probably eight, seven, eight years, nine years I was playing, I was just playing. And... I was just having fun and I was, you know, I was, I was a bit of a larrikin and I used to get out and about a bit around town and I'd probably, you know, I wouldn't change it now because I had such a nice time, I had a good time and I managed to get through it. But I think John had a conversation with me towards the end of the year before half came and he said, look, I'm, I'm going to get rid of a few of your mates um, because they're, I see them as a bad influence on the, on the culture of the, of, the, of the squad. And he said, you're really, really lucky because I was considering getting rid of you as well. I don't know whether he was, but it gave me a bit of a wake-up call. And um, I, I tried to knock him down a bit more after that. And I think that injury really made me become more professional and, 
and a better, more consistent cricketer. I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure it does. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, that's a fantastic answer. I mean, Alex, what about you? I mean, how would you, you're going to be obviously dealing with lots of, lots of players breaking into the county ranks as well as established cricketers. How would you coach yourself back then? Um, I would, I'd force myself to bowl more. Um, and I'd, I would learn quicker how to play more significant uh, innings in four-day cricket. I scored a lot of 50s, um, not enough hundreds. I saw some really, really good hundreds, but threw so many away that um, that was probably those two things are the difference between me having a really, really good chance of, of reaching the international levels that, that these two did. Um, you know, I was, I, I don't know, I was quite a slow learner, I think. I, I, I kind of, one of those where I wish I knew then what I know now. I think about the game a lot differently now. A lot easier said than done, but I think if I'd if I'd been better in those two areas, then then you know I think uh, I'd have had a, a better career. And although I'm very very grateful for the career I had, um, I think it could have been better. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd probably focus on two more performance based things as opposed to stuff off the pitch, which uh, you know which was probably okay at um, just about. Halves, you're obviously coaching at Gloucestershire. But if a young Ian Harvey turned up, how would you deal with him? Send him home, mate. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, that's a, I agree with what both the boys are saying. I mean, coming up in a different, it's a different era now. Um, I'm not sure I'd like to be growing up in the era that, with all the stuff that they do these days. But look, I, there are things that I would have liked to have changed, like the, the fitness side of things. And But when you when you do as much bowling and you're traveling you are playing six months in Australia then six months here and I know that's my choice you don't really get too many pre-seasons and and stuff like that so I, I would like to maybe if I mean if I had time off then I wouldn't have had the times that I had so look from my point of view I would have liked especially in my game to try and get a bit more consistency especially with the bat so um, other than that look I, I wouldn't change too much I don't I think we have to be careful as as coaches that, I mean, yes, there are certain things that, that need to be done and, and the way players go about it. But, I mean, I had a great time when I was playing and, and I wouldn't I wouldn't change too many things on, on how I went about it. But, but as I said, more consistency, uh, especially with the bat, um, in, in the longer form of the game for me. I, I, I'm going to finish with you, Harves, actually. I'm going to sneak in a current day question. I... I I just wanted to know once we get through this frustrating lockdown period, you know, what's your what's your hopes and ambitions for the current Gloucestershire crew, and you know, what what do you think we we can achieve as a club in the coming years? Oh, I think we're starting to get a really good, to give them a good <laughs> really good group of players together at the moment. Um, look, it's it's a bit tough from um, where we are at the moment, but uh, as as Giddo and Louis said earlier, um, hopefully we'll come out of this sooner rather than later and we can all get back to a little bit of normality and, and getting some cricket played this season, which would be great for us. But in the future, I think we, our big step when we come up is to try and stay in that first division. It was a huge, huge season in four-day cricket for us and to be promoted and, and uh, get ourselves ready, have a great pre-season and everyone's ready to go. And then obviously... We, we get hit with the situation we're in at the moment. Obviously, that's all out of our control. But um, a big step forward for us would be staying up and uh, in that first division. It's going to be extremely tough. Um, Giddo and Louis have, have um, been involved in the first division and, and they know how tough it can be. Um, so week in, week out, playing against those players, um, doing it for longer periods of time, it's going to be tough. And then obviously in the white ball stuff, we'd like to to get back to, to 2015 where we come together as a group and, and won the, uh, the 50 over trophy. So, I mean, we're, as I said, we're starting to get a group of guys together who are starting to mingle well and, and play good cricket together as a group. And I think it's just getting a bit more, the confidence is going to be a massive thing come um, when we start back up again. So, but really exciting times for the club. So with everything that's going on, Bit of a shame for the 150th year how it's all panning out for us but 
look, as a, as a member or as a, a coach or a player at the club, it is a, a really exciting time for us. Yeah, well, quite. And we, we, we will celebrate 150th and uh, hopefully we'll have Alex and uh, John to join us uh, at an event. Percy, can I, um, can I say something there, like, on what I've said there? Yeah. Uh, um, I just, I think both these guys are doing brilliant jobs. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm really privileged to be able to get in and around all the counties around the country. And Dawson and Harbour, Gloucester and Alex, and in Alan Richardson and his team up at Worcestershire, like they're continually punching up you know, with small, small budgets, small stuffs, and, and less resource than a lot of other people. And you know, it's, it's really important that clubs like Gloucester and Worcester, and with these guys leading, you know, two mates and teammates, of, ex-teammates of mine, doing fantastic, fantastic work to, to punch against guys who are, who are spending a lot more money and have a lot more resource. So I'm really pleased how, and proud, actually, of how, how these guys are going. And it's um, really great to see. Well, look, th- thanks, John. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Alex, I wish you well for what season we do get. Um, but uh, yeah, ho- hopefully we'll, we'll see you back at Bristol soon. Uh, no, lovely. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to chat to you all. Thanks you very much indeed. Yeah, thank, thank you all. And, um, you know, really, really great chat once again. So appreciate that. Cheers, Alex. Cheers, John. And thank you. Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. No worries. No worries. Thanks, thanks, boys. Cheers, guys. Catch you soon. I was going to tell, tell the story when we played against Warwickshire and you were going to cut strip for the first, <laughs> first, two, first two overs, but no, I'll leave that one. Yeah, that, <laughs> I'm glad we didn't do that, guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys. Cheers, boys. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks all Thanks. Take care. Cheers, boys. Catch up. Cheers, up. Well done.